Okay, then we continue with uh, endogenous growth theory. And um, <clears throat> endogeneity means something that is taking place as a result of internal forces in a system. So it's, uh, there are, it, the, it is the internal characteristics of the economy that is uh, the issue, issue at stake here, and not <coughs> the export or trade uh, issues. We're talking about the, eco uh, the economy in a region, in a city, in a country, uh, defined as an economic system. So <coughs> it, is, it is, again, a a contribution to explain the content of this Fedorn coefficient, this lambda in the four-step model. Uh, <coughs> I'm aware of that in that model, export was a driver, a driving force. But the internal forces and the consideration of uh, internal forces as a as a way of explaining at least part of this, uh, this productivity coefficient, the Ferdorn coefficient, is, is still valid. Because when you talk about increased activity, we are, uh, we are dealing also with the, with the internal characteristics. So <coughs> what we, this, this theory roots back to a work by Paul Romer from uh, Paul Romer from 1986 who who uh, who wrote a, a, a thesis on uh, on this where he observed that uh, the law of diminishing marginal utility or mar diminishing marginal productivity as the size of the capital base and the size of the system in terms of number of employees did not hold. So, because we normally in, 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 uh, in uh, microeconomic theory we say that well as when the size of the uh, of the of the workforce or the size of the capital base increases the marginal productivity of a further small increase in employment or a capital base will yield a less added productivity as compared to a situation where the where the employment and the capital base is rather small so we have a law of diminishing marginal utility. That is a traditional assumption. But he, <coughs> but Romer, he, he, he worked out a theory and tried to also uh, link it up to empirical evidence that the productivity was actually increasing with increased employment and the increased size of the labor market in an area. And that has had some important implications for uh, how we actually can analyze impacts of public policies, including infrastructure investments. So, but he focused then on, on human capital, not so much on, uh, on, uh, on monetary capital, but human capital also mentioned by the article that you have read some, some weeks ago by Calder. Uh, and his, his focus was on research and development as an, uh, as an indicator. Measured in various ways. Uh, you can uh, approach it, for instance, by measuring the number of people with an um, Bachelor of Science or Master of Science or PhD degree 
in a population. And you can see whether you find some correlation between economic output and the education level. You can measure it by trying to address whether more research and development intensive industries like information and communication technology, the medical industry and so on. If you have more of such industries in an area as uh, compared with other areas, you can try to see whether that has an impact on, on economic output. Uh, <coughs> and um, if you study plans for uh, regional development, for instance in this local area, you will find robust labor markets, labor market integration as, as kind of buzzwords, but it is rooted in this, uh, in this type of thinking. So what we have in, in a, uh, as I started to say a little bit about the competitive equilibrium, that is traditional mi microeconomic theory, is that we have producers as price takers. They adapt, optimize, and they're a given set of prices. And uh, that is because there are so many producers and they are producing relatively homogeneous products. So at the margin, the price should reflect the social marginal costs, which are the total costs of producing one, one extra unit. And at the margin, the, pro uh, the profit for the last product sold, last unit sold is zero. Constant returns to scale, <coughs> meaning that a doubling of production, resource, uh, production resources gives a doubling of, of the production. And there are no incentives or even possibilities in the model to do research and development where others can take advantage of the research results with at a very low marginal cost. And I'll come back to how that can, can take place. So this knowledge problem or phenomenon plays actually no role in competitive equilibrium models without external effects. So, so and that was his point of departure, that the, the traditional models, they don't really, like uh, it's described here, they don't really uh, reflect uh, the situation as, as seen in, in the real world, so to speak because research and development takes place. Areas with a high level of uh, knowledge, education, is more productive. So like, uh, he was particularly interested in, in Silicon Valley in California, the information technology center there. So <coughs> the, the model, you have seen this before which is uh, output as a function of a constant, capital and labor. And uh, these are, uh, these are uh, basically elasticities, saying that if you increase capital with, uh, with one unit, the alpha determines the elasticity with respect to the increase in output. So we talked about the um, studies done by David Aschauer, which, we, which I presented in the first lecture, where this alpha was uh, estimated to be some in the area of 0 0.24, meaning that when you increase infrastructure capital with, with 10%, you get a 2.4% increase in, in output, which, which was, by other researchers, considered as being way too high that type of elasticity. But you see here, <coughs> it's capital and labor only. Whereas he tried to introduce another term 
in this equation, namely this h with the coefficient of, of beta, which is the elasticity of a change in human capital. And uh, as I said, human capital can be measured in, 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 in several ways. Share of people with, uh, with uh, high, higher education, the composition of the industry structure, and so on. Literacy rate can be, in some countries, a good indicator, where that is a problem. You won't get much out of that in, in uh, let's say, in Europe, but uh, you can get uh, you can get something out of that, for instance, in Africa. I had a PhD student who graduated a couple of years ago, and he used literature rate as uh, one component in a, in a in a productivity study of African countries, together with transport infrastructure. And, uh, and he actually got, got some significant results on all that. So you see the point here? Introducing human capital uh, will be a, actually a sufficient development of this uh, relationship to break this traditional conventional neoclassical model with a diminishing marginal uh, productivity from capital and, uh, and labor. So this explains in a better way the actual situation, where Y actually increases with the size of the economic system. But it's not necessarily only the size, but it uh, also the composition of the, of the human capital in, in the area. So, I've mentioned externalities. And uh, from, uh, from a course in microeconomics, you may recognize this, this illustration. This is simply, we can say that this is a mark market for uh, research and development in the private sector. So the demand for research and development is uh, is diminishing with uh, it's diminishing with uh, with the costs costs of doing research and development, and it costs often quite a lot of uh, of, of money and uh, and uh, man hours to to do that type of activity. But the the private equilibrium will be in this point, and this is the marginal cost of, uh, of, of doing that type of activity, research and development. So all the private companies in an area taken together, they will demand this amount of research and development services at this price. But the thing is, that the, there are external benefits from research and development. And this is because companies can learn, other companies can learn from uh, one company's research and development results. Let's say if, uh, if a company develops a new, uh, a new uh, medicine, which can cost quite a lot of money to develop. Then other companies can copy or base their own medicines on that research and development efforts taking place, by, which has taken place by and been paid for by, by let's say, one medical company. And then other companies can imitate. And so the, the benefits 
of, of uh, let's say, the private sector's research and development effect, efforts are shown by, is shown by this demand curve, where the MEB is the marginal external benefits. That comes as a consequence of the fact that research and development efforts can be used by others at a very low cost. Examples. I mentioned a few, I mentioned uh, medicines, but there are others. Um, engine oil used in cars and so on is a very frequently used example. Because if one of the big and wealthy oil companies are developing a new formula for, uh, for let's say, a synthetic uh, engine oil, then other companies will crack that oil. They, what they do is that they buy a certain amount of oil from the company that, that has developed this, and then they decompose it by certain chemical processes, and they they not only imitate, but they can even, at a very low cost, develop it a bit further. And hence, the productivity of this initial research and development effort here may be taken further at a quite low cost by competing companies. There are patents protecting the company that do this research and development in the first place, and patents are strictly necessary for this uh, activity to take place. But there are limits to patents, because if you can crack a chemical formula and reconstruct it and, and uh, with a little twist, so to speak, a small improvement or change. They are off this uh, problem with, uh, with copying, imitations, and they can, uh, they can, uh, they can manage to, uh, to, to sell their product legally in the market. So incentives to do research and development <coughs> is not very well uh, presented in a competitive equilibrium model based on traditional microeconomic theory. The need to be some kind of uh, monopolistic competition, meaning that many small actors compete on product variety. They have a certain markup which means profit, uh, even the ones that are, uh, are producing at, uh, at close to the, the competitive equilibrium in, monopolistic in, in terms of uh, being in a monopolistic competition market. They, need, they earn some profits, which they can use for research and development. So they have a certain amount of market power. And if you recall this, this uh, illustration of market power, which goes like this, you have price, costs, and you have quantity, and you have a demand curve, and you have a supply curve. This is the competitive equilibrium. But when you have market power, or I can, sorry, I will redraw it. I know you hate this, but I need to, to do it a bit different. We can assume that you have a supply curve like this, where we have excess production capacity up to this, area, this, this level, 
And this is the competitive equilibrium. Um, and what might be the situation here when we have this uh, type of uh, monopolistic competition is that we, we can we can this is the uh, marginal revenue which is the um, which is derived from the demand curve the slope is twice as uh, as high as as steep as the demand curve and the monopoly price would be something like this. Well, this is a pure monopoly, where the markup, this is the markup, which is the, which is the difference between the monopoly price and the, and the competitive equilibrium price, right? But in a market where you have a constant uh, or, a, or a rather flat uh, supply curve, you could imagine that you have a, an average cost curve, which looks something like this. So what you get in a competitive, uh, sorry, a monopolistic competition market the competition tends to drive the price not down to PF, but down to what we might call PAC. So they are able to earn at least as much as the average cost of the actual, uh, per unit of the actual production volume. And that, it means that they are able to cover the fixed costs of production, including the research and development costs. Because the research and development costs are a part of what we might call investments in this. Because the, the AC here is equal to investments, uh, you have seen this before, plus The number of units produced times the costs divided by the total number of units produced. And this should be x done, not q. Quantity x, like this. So this includes research and development costs. And to be able to, to actually uh, get the coverage of these costs, you need to have a certain market as compared to the competitive equilibrium. But you will not get this situation because this is a situation where there is only one supplier of this, uh, this uh, actual commodity. Monopoly, one. And you, you get a, a very, uh, you might get quite strong reduction in the quantity offered to the market, a very a much higher price. And the incentives to innovate, do de research and development is then and you can think about it that as a quite, uh, it's a quite uh, intuitively reasonable that a monopolist has again weaker incentives to do research and development because they have the market all by themselves. So that is one extreme. The other extreme is that the companies cannot afford research and development because uh, the competition doesn't allow for it. And then you have something in between that gives profits to, to, uh, to do R&D, research and development. 
So <coughs> try to, if you go back to this uh, hoteling uh, lecture that, uh, that we had before Easter, to try to, to compete on product variety instead of price is, uh, is what will be the, the result of a situation like this. Because if you compete on price, you end up here and you don't get much uh, R&D from that. So what we are facing here is that research and development is a kind of a public good. It's there as a result of uh, activities taking place by one or several companies. And knowledge, I can transfer R&D to knowledge. It's non-divisible, it exists as a consequence of, uh, of investments that has been has taken place. It's difficult to piece it up and sell. It's, the situation is that once the research and development results are, for instance, published or made known to the public in general, no one can be excluded from consumption. And also, using R&D results doesn't exclude or reduce other consumers' benefits. So it's there, it's, it's available to the, to the public in general, in some way or another. You may have, you may have to undertake some, or uh, invest, or have to t undertake some costs to get access to the research and development results, but once they are there, uh, they, are, they are available. I'll give you a couple of examples a bit later on. So, but if you consider this non-rivalry characteristic of research and development results, you can use a design of something or a computer program without affecting others who want to do the same. Of course, if you get, uh, if you get a lot of similar design or similar programs, the market will sooner or later be, be saturated. But if you think about it, the, the, log the underlying logic here is that once you get access to a design or a program combined with, and that is important, combined with the situation that you are, you are in, a, in, a, in a kind of a monopolistic competition market, you, need, you, you actually need to innovate to be able to capture market shares. The idea is that such generic knowledge or access to research and development as a public good can stimulate further development at a lower cost. So that is the, that is the logic here. And there are uh, interesting ways of, uh, of, of doing this. Uh, I have mentioned the engine oil industry, the medical industry, but the classic example is the car industry. The Japanese car industry in the 60s worked like this. They bought cars from France and Germany and the US uh, dismantled them into pieces, bits and pieces, and then they used them as, uh, as input in their own production process. I mean, the, the, the layout, the design, the way they had solved problems, technical issues. So the, I remember back in the 1980s, there was a Japanese car who had a exact copy of a Mercedes engine 
but it was stamped Nissan or Datsun at the time. It was slightly more fancy than the Mercedes version. Had a slightly higher output, but it didn't last that long, of course. But I managed then to construct a fairly good engine based on this type of reverse engineering. Those of you who are uh, doing some uh, outdoor activities, you may buy or purchase certain weatherproof clothing at a high price, or you can go for the copy, which does more or less the same job for half the price. The Chinese, quite a lot of the Chinese manufacturing industry is working, or at least they have they started working based on reverse engineering of uh, products from other parts of the world. This thing, and, and one, one point here, you don't need geographic proximity, proximity to do this. So this reverse engineering thing can take place without any particularly, let's say, short transport distances or, or anything like that. But if you come to this type of dissemination of knowledge, human mobility, you are in a different state of affairs. Because human mobility can cause people to bring their knowledge with them to another company. They are starting to work there, bring their competence with them. They learn a bit more at their new employer, employers, new workplace, and then they change work again to another place, and there you go, with this circular uh, causation thing where people change jobs, learn more, change job again, learn even more, and if that b up, uh, that accumulation of skills is observed in the, let's say, by other economic agents around, and they would perhaps choose, uh, they would decide to move to this region where this accumulation of knowledge has taken place. You see those stories quite often. Silicon Valley is one example. It's still a place where young uh, aspiring entrepreneurs, they go to California and try to build up, a, set up a, a company. And they go there because of this type of mechanism. The physical transport system's role in this is, of course, dependent on what type of industry we are talking about. Uh, one could as time goes by, expect that the information and communication technology industry, in, in such industries, the physical proximity might be of less importance as we move along with, uh, with a lot of uh, possibilities to communicate without being present in the same room and so on. But still, there, is, uh, there are some human factor things that goes on between people in the same room that attracts people to co-locate in such, uh, in such uh, concentrated areas. It's actually a quite interesting literature on, uh, on the, the importance of distance between offices for people who works in a common project. And some literature indicates that when the distance exceeds a not very long distance, we talk about 100 meters or something like that, the, the tendency to cooperate closely diminishes, diminishes quite fast. 
But this is, let's say, the main reason why there has been so strong focus on regional integration, and transport systems to connect cities uh, within regions and between regions together to try to get this accumulation of, uh, of uh, human capital to take place. The problem is, as I said, to measure it and to try to find out what does it actually mean in terms of increased productivity, because that is what we are talking about here. And we measure the benefits here in terms of wage increases, output increases, and so on. And then we need, as, a, as researchers, we need to isolate this type of effect from effects that would have taken place anyway in, this, uh, in, the, in the system that we study. Because if you, for instance, get a, a, a shift in demand for the products that is not caused by these people learning more or the level of human capital has uh, increased, but it may be due to, uh, let's say, a, a drop in the oil price, causing people to, to get, perhaps, uh, they can afford to buy the products and so on. So there are lots of things that we need to correct for when we, and to, to control for when we, when we do research on this, these things. This illustration is uh, showing externalities and increasing returns to scale. And this is another type of externality. Because the human capital thing is covered here. Research and development uh, as, a, as a common good, higher social uh, marginal utility of the increased knowledge. But here we can talk about the impacts of the secondary effect of this increase in human capital, namely, as we saw in the, in the circular cumulative causation model, the increase in the size of the economic system. So when the size of the economic system increases, and this is quite similar to, to that, that illustration, we have the average cost curve here, we have the demand here, and we have the price equal to average cost here. But if then, if now this region is, is considered as being more attractive because of the increase in human capital, you get more companies moving in, they demand, let's say, a given type of supply for a, from a secondary industry in the area. The demand for that type of supply shifts if you, can, if you imagine that uh, a big company decides to move into the area, the demand for supplies shifts like this because of the increasing returns to scale, meaning that the average cost curve is, is diminishing. The new equilibrium point given a monopolistic competition will be here and prices go down from A1 to A2. We call this an externality that works through the market. It's a pecuniar externality. And pecuniar has to do with money, <clears throat> and it has to do with the fact that the prices of the commodities, of the supplies, goes down a bit. And that is also a quite attractive factor for companies, perhaps, to move into the region because the, the, the factor prices of the supplies is, is actually diminishing.
So two mechanisms, pure or technical externalities. The figure that I showed you on uh, the illustration on the, with the triangle on the shift from the private to the social marginal utility, the shift in the, in the demand for research and development services. And this is what we can call a pecuniary effect or a volume effect. When you have this excess capacity in the production network, you have this diminishing uh, average cost curve and you have this price effect. So these two effects are, let's say, the theoretical backbone for trying to investigate into whether transport infrastructure can cause some of these effects to take place. People working more closely together, that is point A, and point B, the size of the economic system, better integrated, can cause such volume effects to take place. <coughs> so, um, why do we have such increasing returns to scale and what are the consequences then? Uh, Many firms are competing for market shares, as I said. Uh, each firm is small. They are not price takers. But they will try to protect their innovations as much as possible. But we have this type of dissemination, mainly along two, two types of channels, reverse engineering or wider labor market. And then we have the, the effect on uh, demand for the products. And we also have the effects of more companies competing. The more research and development activities you will get, and the higher the human capital component of the, in the production function will, will be done. This is more or less what I have <coughs> said already, but it, in, an important aspect here is that you, you kind of stand on the sho shoulders of previous research when you, when you develop things uh, further. And then the, the, the tendency to, to get the reduced prices. Policy implications here. You can observe them. Uh, through public support of education systems. Because when you have such kind of common goods like research and development, you, you and, uh, and the, let's say, the acknowledgement that human capital matters in the production function, then that is a, gives a case for, for public support. Because only private support of common goods results in the situation that too little of the common goods will be uh, supplied to the market because the private sector in itself doesn't have enough strong enough incentives to provide the necessary amount of public goods. The same <coughs> public support in innovative industries public sector, the government in many countries have national research councils. Norway has one, NRC, Norwegian Research Council. And their task is to, among other things then, to support innovative industries by, by launching research and development programs. So those companies can apply for public funding of research and development activities on certain conditions. One condition is that uh, this research and development should be uh, made available to uh, other players in the economy, which demands, uh, which 
or sorry, it doesn't include, it doesn't exclude the possibility of seeking, applying for uh, patents. But also the patents are uh, kind of, kind of transparent. But uh, the objective here is to, to correct for the fact that leaving this to the private sector will not provide the society with enough research and development services. And then a third implication, which is not very, let's say, politically correct these days, is to protect the domestic industry. Norway, <coughs> Norway did that, and still does, I think, when it comes to the supply industries, to the oil and gas industry. Less of it today than it used to be uh, 30, 40 years ago. And the telecom industry. And the most well-known example is perhaps Nokia in Finland, which is now uh, more or less gone. As a, as a cell phone industry, uh, some minor activity left, I think, was bought by Microsoft a couple of years ago. But they started as a <coughs> producer of rubber boots and, uh, and the car tires. Not very similar to cell phones, you might say. But massive R&D funding from the, from the government combined with a management that had some different strategic ideas um, made that possible and they made it quite well for, uh, for a period of say 30 years. Actually they uh, competed out a quite promising Norwegian cell phone industry back in the 80s. I had a cell phone actually in 1980, believe it or not. It was like this, produced in Norway. So the GSM, the Global Systems Mobile Network, was, uh, was invented in Trondheim, north here. So it's, it's uh, actually, it originates from this region. And then transport infrastructure. I'll continue now because I, 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 I need to finish a bit early today. So I'll just continue five more minutes, uh, if that's okay with you. Um, transport infrastructure, and we'll talk, talk more about this um, next time. Uh, and uh, relate that to, to the wider economic impacts. I have mentioned these examples already. Uh, I will talk also about empirical assessment of, uh, of more tightly integrated labor markets. Uh, and as I said, since 2007, I, I believe since 2005, quite a lot of efforts have been made to, to, to say something about, about the magnitude of these wider economic impacts. And then I'm talking about whether the value of travel time savings for the users of the transport network is affected by the size of the economic system in itself. And you can translate the change in tr the value of travel time savings can be translated to uh, let's say, change in productivity per, per hour work time. And the change in labor productivity can be uh, justified by uh, these type of learning effects, mobility effects in the, in the labor force that we, uh, that we can observe in, in some, uh, some systems. So <coughs> there are some 
uh, empirical findings from, uh, from this. Uh, I will talk more about the empirical findings related to wider economic impacts next time. We need to be aware of identification problems, causes and effects here, that uh, some type of, uh, let's say, added benefits of, uh, of transport infrastructure investment may be due to, let's say, Weberian optimization behavior, which doesn't add much to the value of time as such, but it can add, add um, add value to the, let's say, to the transport infrastructure project, for instance, by means of increased movements of vehicles, increased traffic. So this is, uh, this is actually a very interesting. We, we, uh, we do some work here at the moment with uh, trying to derive uh, added or wider economic impacts of transport. And we do that by comparing projects, let's say a fixed fjord link in an area, and the benefits from that in terms of, uh, of uh, increased regional, regional output. And we compare a region with a project, let's say a fixed link with a region of similar characteristics, but without the fixed link. It's a method that is called difference in difference, and it's based on, uh, on a, a kind of uh, technique that is used in, in medical research, where they compare patients with treatment and without treatment, and try to see whether they achieve some, some effects. But that will be uh, something that I will show you next time. This is a summary of this endogenous growth logic growth in terms of uh, economic growth. Determinants, capital, labor, which is a traditional micro uh, component. Technology, human capital, is then, let's say, the new type of explanatory factors that, uh, that, is, uh, that comes from this uh, theory. And other, <coughs> other uh, variables, like uh, which are more, let's say, of, of a political nature. Underlying these two are then research and development, diffusion of knowledge, and then the schooling, education thing, again affected by co government policy. So this was the, let's say, the scheme that was included in this work. But then uh, transport has been aided, added by, uh, by, uh, later, uh, res by, by later research, where transport as a facilitator for growth in these two yellow boxes has been focused. So I think that ends today's lecture. When you read this, uh, when you read the literature, you will, I think, you'll uh, combined with the lecture notes. I think, uh, lecture notes. I think you will get a fair impression of, of the importance of this, uh, this way of thinking. And when we have uh, gone through next week's lecture, I think you will also have a fair understanding of how we ap can apply this in in practice when we address the social benefits of uh, infrastructure investments. So, I think this has been uh, not a very good uh, environment for lecturing with all this noise. Hopefully you have benefited somewhat from it. Thank you. Du tänker på den uppe, siste gruppa? Ja. Det kan jag göra. Det ska jag göra.